So welcome everybody to the November Atlanta uh, Robotics Monthly Meetup. Thanks for coming out. I see some new faces. Hopefully you had time to network with everybody. Um, so I'm Charles Franklin. I'm the organizer of the meetup, uh, along with my co-lead, JC, who runs uh, Atlanta Ventures uh, uh, and does a lot of marketing in the studio up here at Atlanta Tech Village. Uh, and I'm the CEO of Greensy, and I'm, I'm glad that I get to talk to you about Greensy and robotic lawnmowers today. Um, so uh, I'm going to dive right in. I have a few slides, a uh, quick presentation, and then open it up for questions for you guys uh, or for anything you have. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. So I want to talk to you a little bit of, about uh, robots in general and my theory on, on robotics in, in, in the world. I have a unique theory on that. Uh, robotics specifically in the green industry, which is what we call lawn maintenance and lawn care. Uh, I'll talk to you about Greensy, a little bit about Ross. How many people have used Ross or the robotic operating system? So I see one, two, three, a couple. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll open up for questions. So um, first, I, I have a theory on robotics, uh, and that is that I think that robotics are already all here. I think it's a slow creep. I think it's a lot like what we see in the future where we think of like these robots as being like more like this, but I think robotics, when you look at the real definition of the sort of word robotics, um, we talk a lot about like automating tasks that humans normally do. And we think about, you know, automating things that are repetitive or boring. So let's take a quiz and I want to ask you like, which one of these things are robots? These, I think we'd agree these are robots, right? They kind of even look like humans. Uh, this is a company called Rethink Robotics and they came out with Baxter and Sawyer and as of a month ago, this company is now gone. Uh, you know, not that it's a, a, a story that we probably want to talk about, but you know, they How took they a ton. Of, or did they, just die? they took funding uh, for a number of reasons why they're now gone. But I think it had a lot to do with a very cool concept without a commercial application. So uh, they got a ton of funding. I think it was like 150 million dollars worth of funding, and now they are literally gone. Um, and so they tried to sell these robots and they just didn't sell enough of them. A lot of the robotics manufacturers were like, great concept, have the face, you know, it needs a face, why it needs a face, but could not, could not figure out how to make these things really useful. So that let that be a lesson to any future creepy, right? roboticists. What's that? The face is kind of creepy. It is kind of creepy, right? So. Like it's just eyes. All right, so these are robotics, but back to our quiz. All right, pop quiz. Are these robots? Yes. Yeah, I agree, right? So these are like in car manufacturing now. We're seeing a lot more robotics taking over some of these highly repetitive tasks, taking a, something and putting it on a car. Right. I agree with you. What about uh, this bat? This robot is for the Sobot from Software Animation. If you were at our last, who was at our last meetup? Cool, a few of you, yeah. So what is this one, yes? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so this is a clothing robot. So this robot can basically do a lot of the sewing on jeans and, and shirts. I think one of their robots can actually produce a shirt in about like the, the size of this room, this robot can produce a shirt. I'd agree with that. What about this? Yeah. Uh, I see some maybes. What is it? It's a parking garage. Maybe it's downstairs at ATV. Why, why would you say this is robotics? It's automated, it keeps track of everything and it takes your money. Yeah, and, and you know, it's got this sort of you think about it like a long time ago, like we used to have humans who sat in a booth. And then even before that, we probably had like, you know, when there was a gate or something, we had people who would open the gate. You'd be like, hey, go open the gate for them. They're coming, you know, like to my house or whatever. So yeah, I think robotics have sort of automated some of this. I think it's robotics for sure. All right, what about this one? Oh, sure. All right, it's a robot stuck on a t-shirt. So yes, I think this is, this is a repetitive task going back and forth, doing vacuuming robot. Uh, what about this one? So this is the Husqvarna. This is a robo mower. We'll talk more about these for sure. Uh, what about this one? This is something I built. This is a Raspberry Pi, and it looks like it's connected to some kind of breadboard, and it looks like it's connected to this remote to raise and lower these shades. Is this robotics? Yeah. How so? Why is that? Automated. It's automated. It's something that I used to have to do every day was lower and raise the shades, and now I don't. All right. What about this? Do it automatically? I don't know. What do you think? This is the, the Nespresso coffee machine. So, you, you know, technically it could be a task that a craftsman or some person might do. I would make you coffee, and now I can press a button and do it. Wait, I think the I think people making it just press a button to do it too. 
That's right, too, maybe. Or, or you used to have to grind them. You, there's ways you can do it by hand and then put, put them in there and do a pour over. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting to me is I think that, uh, I think this is robotics. I think it's a slow creep for it to sort of keep, what happens is it keeps taking over on a lot of these tasks that are either highly repetitive or things that maybe humans don't want to do. But I think that's mixed. We might agree that, what do you think about this? This is the Tesla autopilot. Is this robotics? Yeah, I, th I think it's a mix, right? This could be more like the machine learning side. Like, I'm taking over on what is a task that humans would do where I can take my hand off the wheel, and what I used to have to do is kind of look and make sure I'm in the lane, turn left. When I'm not in the lane, turn right, you know, and, and, and do that. So yeah, I, I'd say this is robotics. Yeah. Uh, and then hopefully I'm gonna talk to you about this type of robotics, which is what we're building, which is adding autopilot to these types of mowers. So I would say that all of these are robotics. Um, so how'd you do on the quiz? All of them were robotics. Did you, did you guess? Did you guess? I mean, I think you passed. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, about the actual sort of mowing of lawns. And I'm gonna pull out my little notes over here because I've got a few things on Ross I wanna tell you all about. And there's a little plug flying around. So let me do this real quick. Um, where's my mouse? Over here. Sorry, let me grab my notes. Presenter view. So um, I would say that in mowing lawns, there's a task that humans do that's hard, repetitive, it's in the hot, hot sun, it requires precision, especially you wanna get those stripes, and it sounds ideal for a robot, and so that's what we are doing. So let me tell you a little bit about the problem that we're trying to solve. When we spoke with a lot of commercial landscapers uh, about this, this is uh, how a typical sort of company that does commercial landscaping will do. They come out in like a box truck, and they usually have a commercial mower like this. This is a ride-on. And then they have several other people that are working. And so uh, this past season was very, very rough. We have a, a labor shortage problem. Uh, a lot of the people that I spoke with said it's the worst it's ever been in 18 years. And we just could not find enough people to do the work that we had. So when crew members don't show up, what ends up happening is the crew leader ends up being on the mower. And so he has to sort of not, uh, a lot of the people who are sort of uh, doing the work are not supervised, which is a problem. So it, it happens to be because we have a severe labor shortage, there's low unemployment, we have some immigration issues, and I just think, frankly, nobody wants to sit uh, on a mower for 12 hours in July, especially here in the South. Like, it's really hard. Uh, and when we went out and rode with some, even in like September and August, it was just still ungodly hot. So lawns went unmowed this past season uh, all over the country, uh, especially here in the Southeast, and customers weren't happy. So, uh, there are auto mowers out there. Um, this right here is the steel. This one's coming out this year. Uh, it's about 1300 bucks. This is the Husqvarna 450S. These are more like Roombas for the lawn. And the way they all work uh, is they have a boundary wire. And this boundary wire is kind of like the electric dog fence. So you install it by either placing it, they show you doing this, but really you have to trench it to, for it to really work that well and you have to do it just right from the edge, otherwise you're gonna be mowing still this area right on the edge of where your property is. Uh, and my co-founder has a few of these. He has two of these, and he has two of the other previous versions of this, and they're really more like toys. Um, you know, so to be fair, these, they, they do work, but they, uh, they work okay. Um, you know, if they get stuck, you have to come unstick them, uh, and um, to use them, you gotta mow your lawn first, and so because they only do maintenance cuts, so I think kind of does, uh, and they also don't do that stripe pattern. They say that it's probably better, but I think that's just what they say. Um, and so the market is really comprised of a lot of these old line manufacturers building these equipment that are based on hardware, and the answer is software. I happen to know that because I think software is the answer to everything. <laughs> I truly think the market needs a sort of Tesla-like approach to let's build the way that I would mow my lawn if I, if I could do software. So if you're like me and you're a knowledge worker, uh, which means I don't do any hard work for a living. I just use my my fingers to type. Uh, you don't have the knowledge or even the manpower, and maybe you don't even own a mower. Um, so maybe you use a company, and, and it's supposed to be an emoji of the, the face there, but it's <laughs> kind of mixed there. Um, but um, uh, so maybe you call a company like Lawn.com, and in full disclosure, I'm an investor there. You should use them if you don't want to mow your lawn because they'll do it for you oh, now. Yeah. 
uh, and uh, and so what they do is they show up typically in different and, and they use commercial products to do this so um, thinking about it there's when you do mow your lawn there's a couple tasks that have to happen you have to edge it you have to weed it and then you have to mow it and when you mow it you're gonna go back and forth and you're gonna strike the lawn you know, back and forth and this part is boring it's repetitive and it's requires precision so it's perfect for robots so what we want to do is we want to automate it with robotics so here is Greensy's mission I'll tell you right now we want to free humans from boring repetitive manual labor um, and, the, and again just to be clear we don't want to free people from all labor uh, I think people do need a purpose but I think that doing uh, carpal tunnel inducing tasks again and again that are just completely boring and require no creativity I think is not suited for us. I think that's why we are humans and we invented things like fire and wheels and technology and sticks. Uh, it's to do the stuff that makes us more human, not to do the stuff that makes us more like a competitive robot. So uh, step one is we're gonna assemble high-end robotic software for lawn maintenance companies. And then once we figure that out, we're gonna use that knowledge to build these consumer models that we think we can build a better auto mower without the boundary. And then uh, after we do that, uh, three years from now, maybe five, we're gonna build a framework that frees humans from all this repetitive, boring labor along the way. So we're gonna automate the boring part uh, and turn three-person crews of lawn, mower, uh, lawn mowing companies into two-person along with our technology. So the way we're doing that is we have a retrofit kit that we're building, and the retrofit kit fits on these commercial mowers. Now this is the uh, most popular stand-on mower. Now these don't look like your normal mowers. These are what commercial companies that show up in box trucks look like. This stand right here can fold up so you can operate it stand-on like this, uh, or you can stand on this and lean against this. This little pad is made for a human to sort of stand. Uh, and these controls make it go forward and backward, uh, and you can set the speed and the sort of depth of the thing, and they are basically called zero-turn mowers. So these mowers can turn these sort of free wheels right here allow them to turn pretty much zero, like on a dime. So this mower is the X Mark. This is the 2018 model. We have one of these, uh, and it is fun. I'll show you a video in a second. And so what we're doing is we're taking a kit, uh, and this is a mocked up version of it, and we put all of our sensors, including our cameras, which you don't see on here, and some IMUs and some other things, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then basically we turn it into a data problem. So this right here is the lawn. This is our lawn, our test lawn, which happens to be right out here. And what I tell uh, investors when I talk to them is that this is our test <coughs> lawn on Piedmont. What they don't know is that this is Chase Bank and this is a very busy road and here's our office right here. This is where we are. Um, but they don't know that, that's okay. So this is um, one of the mappings that we've done with a boundary here uh, with very accurate GPS. If you've ever worked with GPS, you probably use a form of it that cuts off at about four decimal points, is that right? Four or five. Four or five. So four or five will get you one meter accuracy, which will put you in the sidewalk if you're mowing the lawn. So we need centimeter level. So we're using a piece of technology called real-time kinematics, and we're able to get it down to the centimeter level. And so there's a lot of data points. Height is very important. Where you actually are in the world is important uh, when you get down to that level of accuracy. So. That's what we're doing. So here's how our product works. Once you've installed it on a mower like this, right? So you, uh, what we do is we do it just like a normal uh, landscaper would do. They show up and they do the boundary. So maybe they start here, they pull their this machine off the truck, and then what they do is they do the boundary. So they go around it. And by the way, this machine works like a normal machine. It's just got one extra button on it, and so they just manually go around the boundary. And this is their just normal sort of controlling it, just like they normally would do. They go all the way around. And then once they get all the way around, then the machine then will allow them to press the autopilot button, which you cannot see here because we haven't added it yet. But once they hit the autopilot button, it is because it now knows the boundary based on software. They can then step off, which is what this person is doing, and then the mower will continue and basically strike the lawn. So this is called an ox cart pattern. Uh, this is a classic sort of uh, navigation, robot navigation called the ox cart. And basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to cover this geometric area in the sort of these stripes. And people who do commercial lawn mowing would say that's great, you know, to do it one way, but it's very better for the grass to do it the other way. So the, the, uh, the system allows for that. In fact, it keeps track of it and you can say, oh, I want to do it this way next time. And so the, the system can do that. 
so right now we have that software working, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it, and we're building in this retrofit kit now that hooks into the controls and does that. So our prototype right now can manually allow manual map for this. It does okay with boundaries with sort of objects, so you notice this lawn is kind of nice because it doesn't have any trees or anything in it, and that's by design. This is our prototype. We just started. Uh, what we can do, and our software does allow for it, is technically the mower could say, once it got here, uh, he or she could go and say, say there's a tree here, they could go and do a circle around it and say, don't do this. And then the pathing algorithm is really good. It, it basically will do a perfect strike around it, and it'll use that as the path. It'll say, I can't go there as well. So the future versions will have uh, object detection sort of for dynamics, so like if somebody walks in front of it, it's very important now that these, this area be clear when the person is doing this because we do not do anything to stop it uh, if it were to hit somebody. So we're working on that. Do you have like an abort button? We have a lot. We have uh, something we call e-stop. I've been told not to use the word kill switch. The word is e-stop. That was like kill switch with robots. That's right. Uh, the word is e-stop, which, which sounds better, right? It's electronic stop, like it can stop faster than us, which is true. So we have, um, based on the latest diagram I saw, there are four physical e-stops. There's one on the operator's wrist that operates in LoRa, which is not like internet. I mean, it's basically like very, um, it's like a radio connection to the device, so it's very quick. So if they see a jogger or somebody come by, they can hit the button and it just stops, cuts all power to it. There's uh, one, there are two, there's one on the top, one on the front, and two on the side. So if it does sort of come near you and you don't aren't able to do that, um, and we also are working on some uh, little sensors for the front uh, that we will add to it. But our prototype is really for a, a clean sort of lawn where there's supervision. We'll get there, one step at a time. So um, how does the software work? Just a little bit on this. The key for us is a software-based boundary. So what we've been able to do with, um, based on this, uh, uh, this real-time kinematics is you can see that this is what the system recorded when we walked around this lawn and simulated the mowing. We actually used a little mower to sort of do this, turned it, came around. And then the system says, okay, I got you. What's even cooler to note is that the software even did this, found this little boundary and said, this looks like there's something here, I'm gonna occlude it and I won't mow it, which is kind of nice. So you can also clean that up uh, post. But right now it's all automatic. And then it basically said, I'm gonna do pathing right here. And so this is the path that it would take and it'll go back and forth in that ox cart pattern. Now, we are working on the software 2.0 version. I'll get to that in a second. Here's our <coughs> basic software block diagram. Now, this isn't, um, we're using, like I said, we're using the robotic operating system, so you'll see ROS stuff in here. Um, I'll do a quick primer on ROS for those of you who haven't done it, but here is the basic control mechanism. Uh, for how we're doing our robot. I'll dive a little more into detail in a second, but the way that you should be thinking about this problem is the way we're thinking about this problem is that we are simulating this first, and I'll show you what the simulator looks like. Ross has a really great simulation tool called Gazebo, and Gazebo is basically kind of like a 3D environment where you can basically put your robot in, you can tell it the weight and the sizing and all this stuff, and then you can simulate it. It even has <coughs> friction and inertia and stuff you have to set up. Uh, once we've gotten a lot of that and we did a lot of our pathing in there, we're moving to a smart, smaller prototype based on the Raspberry Pi just to test uh, stuff with the encoders and things like that. And I'll show you where we've got that working. We're working on that, and we're simultaneously working on that on our big mower, that XMark mower that you saw. So all of those do it, and we have three different controllers that interface with that. There is also a way to do, uh, you know, this only works, we've got a keyboard or sort of remote control where we can do it with a keyboard and move it around uh, for manual override. Uh, and then what it does is basically um, it takes all this sensor data, so uh, GPS you know of, RTK is real-time kinematics, that has that correctional centimeter level to GPS. IMU, anybody know what IMU stands for? Inertial motion unit. So this uh, is, uh, everyone actually has one of these on their, on their iPhone. IMU can give you very accurate, you know, which heading you're facing. So that's why when you're sort of doing GPS and you're walking, and a good IMU will tell you, oh, you're facing this way. Uh, that combined with odometry, what's odometry? Anybody know what odometry is? Isn't that counting steps? Right, very much a counting steps, he said. Yeah, and that's right. That would be like, uh, you're right, how many rotations a wheel has done, and so you can get pretty somewhat accurate. 
uh, combined with some camera, and on our camera, we have a pretty legit camera. We have a RGBD camera. An RGBD, uh, RGB you probably know stands for red, green, blue. What is the D? Depth, right? So it's shooting out laser and sort of can say like, oh cool. So what's kind of neat is when you look at the output of it, it has a two images usually most of the time when you visualize it, not that you need to because it's for robots, not for humans, but the, you can see the camera image and then there's another like depth that's usually uh, done in some kind of uh, color scale to show you where things are farther or super quicker away. So we take all that and we do this process called localization. And this is the hard problem in robotics, right? Localization is where am I? Based on my environment, where am I? Uh, and so here's where I think you could totally, we were talking earlier about take the software 2.0 approach, which is the machine learning approach, right? And you could say, based on you know, what I see, instead of sort of coding all these rules, you could say, hey, I just want, I treat it as a black box, take all this stuff, you tell me where you are, mow the lawn, don't kill anybody, get it done. Uh, we are not there yet. We're having to do a lot of this with path planning and be very specific to the robot. But what we are doing is we are recording all of the data. And it's very important that we do that just like Tesla. And we're putting it on the cloud and these big sort of things, big, big buckets. Um, and maybe we'll use Amazon, maybe we'll use Google, I don't know. I was talking to the Amazon guy in the room. Uh, so, uh, We'll see where we put that, but um, we're recording all that data so that we could then apply machine learning to it later. So, um, before I go on, I'll tell you a little bit about how ROS works so that you can kind of know. ROS is a really neat uh, robotic operating system. It's an open source platform for doing robotics, and uh, credit to RoboHub, uh, ROS 101 on this, but the way it works is um, uh, everything is sort of a node, and nodes uh, will then publish topics and other nodes can subscribe to topics. I'll give you an example here real quick. So you can actually, with ROS, have a, a multi sort of robot where you have a, ro a robot that's sort of on the server or a computer on the server uh, on the actual thing and then you can even have like a laptop. And both of them could subscribe to the same ROS to be able to visualize it. So maybe you have a, a camera node that's publishing to something called a topic called uh, capture data. And so it's publishing out its data and, and generally, ROS, you talk about things publishing in sort of hertz, which means sort of per second. So maybe you'll say, I'm gonna publish my camera data, like a new frames every 30 frames per second, which is, what, uh, what's that, hertz? Two, 30 hertz? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you would maybe have this. Then what happens is you could have an image processing node that says, I wanna detect where there's sidewalk and where there's grass. And so this would say, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna listen to the topic called camera data that's being published, and I'm gonna do my processing on it. And then maybe it's gonna do something, maybe where it, another thing talks to it and says like, should I keep mowing? And maybe you have another node that's like, should I keep going? And it, it's saying, well, if I see grass, then I'm gonna keep mowing. If I see sidewalk, I'm gonna stop. Uh, and all that stuff, uh, and then what's also cool is that when this guy over here, this laptop, uh, might register with the node master and say, I want to just display it so that the human sitting on the laptop could see what this robot sees. It could say, I just want to display what's in the camera data. Um, and so with this system, it's kind of nice. Uh, it's, um, it works off something called PubSub technology, if you've ever used that before, where things are publishing and things are subscribing. And what's nice is that if this dies, or kills, or cancels, or crashes, or whatever, you don't crash the whole system and you can sort of reboot this one or bring this one back in. Uh, and the master, what it does is it's, it does, isn't really necessary after the first bit because it'll register and say where things are, but then it doesn't do anything afterwards. When this thing is publishing, these communicate without going through the master. So it's kind of nice. Um, so if you haven't done much with ROS, it's really fun. You can boot it up and kind of do the hello world for ROS. And if you have a Linux computer, it's pretty easy to do. There's lots of stuff on it. Does it take up a lot of room? What, Ross? Yeah. Um, no, the most current distribution uh, is called Kinetic, I believe. Melodic. Melodic, excuse me. Uh, and I think it's a pretty quick install. I think we have pretty fast internet here, though, so I can't remember it's the last time we did it. It's under Gigabyte, for sure. Okay. Yeah, it's under Gigabyte. I just wonder if we're putting it on like a Raspberry Pi. It definitely compiles on a Raspberry Pi, although... Yeah, yeah, yeah there are some special built images for it, uh, because if you try and compile it, it takes... Oh, God. 
took hours. Yeah, it takes, yeah. That's especially if you want everything. Like, yeah. what's nice is that you're probably going to want, I mean, when you install RAW, so you're not going to need the 3D simulation on the RAT. On the, on the, yeah, on the you put that on your computer. Yeah, so there's a desktop version, and then there's like the hardened sort of like just the nodes I want. Like, I just want localization and camera and pedometry. So you can pick and choose. Um, so what's fun is the way we kind of approach this problem is the way we do everything and we did it uh, sort of iteratively. So this was one of the first uh, pieces of code we wrote, it was called Mo Lawn. And this is part of Ross, it's called Turtle Sim. And so Turtle Sim is like very basic, uh, it kind of looks like, uh, what does this look like? Uh, it looks like Lego. Like this. Yeah, it reminds me of the Python drawing. Yeah. And so it is, you can use Python or you can use C to do this. And so what we built was our first version of our pathing algorithm. So this is the Molon method, and very early on we wrote this to where it would say, hey, and you could watch the turtle do it. It would sort of go over to the boundary and say, oh, I'm going to draw like this around the boundary. And then it would just do sort of uh, its own little pathing right here. So this was uh, very early on. Once we got this working, we moved over to the simulator. And this is a, a picture of Gazebo. And so this is a, a simulation of our robot with some weights. Mm, kind of right. Maybe some friction problems, maybe some inertia problems. but. Now when you go into the 3D space, it's a little bit trickier, but we got our, our algorithm working there. And then it was time to move on to the uh, sort of the, the real world. I think I have a video of our uh, robot. Let's see if it'll work here. This is, oh, let's see. This is an early version of the robot. <coughs> see if you can detect what's wrong with this one. And, uh, this one's actually working. I think I have another video of us spinning it out, crashing it, which is cool to do in simulation. But you don't want to do that in the real world. So, uh, yeah, this is our, our robot moving around. So after we got our simulation, we said, let's move up instead of going right to the X smart mower. So the next thing we did was we went to this um, uh, little Raspberry Pi version. Um, and so this is one of the earlier prototypes. We've since reprinted the uh, chassis. It's now green, very important. Uh, and it's now got a bigger space here because we've added some wheel encoders. And now we've got to do another print. Thank you, Georgia Tech Convention Studio. We've moved some of the other data here. The camera is now mounted in the front because it looks cooler that way. Uh, and so we're using this to test some of the zero turn functionality that we need to test on the ground. So the problem with doing smaller robots, though, is you run into odometry problems uh, because it's, it's you know a lot less accurate than, say, like a real wheel. Uh, but nonetheless, we're moving up the chain. This is going to help us test more of the pathing algorithms it's also hard to test some of the GPS stuff because our GPS units are about as big as this unit too. So it's all in sort of simulation. We're using this to test certain things. Eventually, uh, we're going to put it on one of these. And this would be called inappropriate use of a mower. I don't know if you heard that. But, uh, these things are, are a beast. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, that was at the sort of, what you do is you ramp it up to the sort of the top control here. And, uh, <coughs> it's pretty fast. It's pretty fun too. Those things are fun. They are very fun. Uh, and so this is the one we, we're going to automate. This is the, the X mark that I was telling you about. Uh, this is for the, the most popular commercial stand on power. But what's crazy about this device too, if you notice, is it's very um, precise. When you look at the controls where you're sort of uh, holding full forward, that's at 100%. Uh, and when you let go of one, it's basically each 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 wheel has an actuator, or hydraulic. each wheel has a hydraulic uh, hydraulic and hydraulic motor. hydraulic motor. So it's determining each one. So you can do some very cool stuff if you sort of go one one way, one the other way, and it's very precise. Um, it's obviously going to be very cool to have a robot do it because um, in, later on in this video, I try and navigate it into a sort of tight space, and I'm doing like this. Because I just don't have the dexterity to do it, but robots will be able to do it precisely correct and just go straight as we want it to. That's the theory. Uh, so we're working on that control mechanism now that hooks in here, uh, and we'll be able to operate those controls for us. So um, a few more things I want to show you all. Uh, let's see, almost there. So one of the cool things that we're working on right now is something called uh, the, the hardest part is this localization. So when robots talk about localization, this is something called uh, SLAM. Uh, and SLAM, 
is simultaneous localization and mapping. So when a robot, in this case, this robot is in simulation mode, a lot of these uh, uh, drawings here are, are sort of devices and sensors, and they're showing you their sort of X, Y coordinates that way. And what we do is we talk about those being attached to the frame. So in some robots, you can actually have a camera that can move like this and still be attached to the frame versus a camera that can't move and do like this. So in this, in this one, this one's probably got some LiDAR or some type of 3D, and what it's doing is it's sent out a point cloud, and you see it's, it's gathering all this data, so it sees these walls. Now, indoor SLAM is pretty known. There are a ton of algorithms for it. You know, I read a paper today where there's about 10 algorithms for doing it, everything from Orb SLAM to Hector SLAM, and these are all algorithms to say, how do I publish, or how do I figure out as a robot where I am in the world and where I can go? Um, and so what we're doing is uh, we're working on something right now called, um, and here's a, a sort of video of a robot. This is what it's actually doing. And so it's pushing out, or basically it's, it's got these LiDAR that are sort of scanning, and we'll, you'll see it again. And what it's doing is simultaneously while it's doing localization, it's also mapping. So you see it saw that wall. And so this sort of, this LiDAR is basically going around and around. And now it got here and can see more into this room. So then it goes into this room. And again, it's simultaneously localizing and saying, where am I? As well as mapping and building a map of its environment. Now this works great in the indoors because you can balance these lasers, usually called LiDAR, off of walls in this room. It's great. In the outdoor, it's kind of hard. So we're working with something right now uh, called, um, this is, uh, is it RTAB Map? And RTAB Map is very cool because what it does is it uses cameras. Uh, I talked about those cameras and a little bit of depth to basically map a lawn. Now, this is neat because a, a robot kind of walked around in here, mapped all this, and then we pointed ourselves up in 3D and said, oh, look at what we're looking at. Clearly there's a house here, there's some trees here, and it looks like all this lawn that needs to be mowed, right? So that's all just from the camera? That's all from camera and uh, depth. Yeah, right? So this is an RGBD depth. camera or a stereo camera along with a uh, camera. Uh, and so you can do this with like multi, uh, as well, which is kind of cool. There's some new algorithms coming out. Um, the ones that we're working with, um, this one is really cool. This is the RTAB map. I'm not going to show you the full thing here, but this is uh, the RTAB map it's using outdoor stereo slam. So what this does, and we'll fast forward through it, is when it starts, this is the, uh, like I said, this is the, the, the robot, and you've got its, all its base stuff. And what it's doing is this is what it actually, the camera's seeing. And so here's what it's doing is it's creating this map uh, of this environment. And so basically, um, this algorithm does something called, uh, very unique, called closed loop finding. And so what it's trying to do is it's basically saying, I'm going somewhere, but I'm going to try and cons uh, continually close the loop and see if I've been here before. And so what it's doing is it's taking measurements, uh, and you can see these wheels are turning, so it's doing odometry. So it knows about how far it's gone. Uh, and I'm going to fast forward to the end because what you're going to see is eventually it's going to go out and it's going to do a, a circle. Uh, and let's see if I can it's fast gonna forward. Close the loop. It's going to close the loop. And what, what's going to happen is you'll see where it thinks it is. And here's a, a gentleman behind it who's probably controlling it. So this is just a teleop. We call it teleop is just another name for remote control. So he's probably got a PlayStation or Xbox controller doing it. And let's see if we can get all the way to the end. So as it comes back closer to the house where it started, oh, here we go, I skipped too far. So what happened is, you see this is where we started. So you can see where it's built this you know, point cloud, we call this a point cloud map, or this is also called a, uh, like a 3D uh, occupy, occupy map. And so it's coming back to the area. Now the robot is gonna think, it saw a bench here, it sees another bench here, it's getting close to the point where it is. It thinks it's over here because of odometry. And all of a sudden, you're going to see something happen when it gets right here. It just said, I know where I am. And it fixed itself it, it, off of where it thought it was, and it completed the map. And so now, we can actually take this 3D visualization, and we can zoom in and zoom out. The odometry put it here, like it was sort of off but it's fixed itself, so now it's got this full 3D map of the area. Now this, this map, this is probably about, I would say it's probably about 300 meg worth of data, probably, uh, depending on the resolution that you're doing. You could go in and fill in the rest. 
Well, that's, that's the theory could be that it could. You could definitely, um, and with the tests we've done, you can take this RGBD camera and you can fill it in, you can try going around and around. But it, what it does is the whole point of it is that it's trying to remember, like, I've seen this before mm -hmm. based on the, step, the stereo data and based on the depth data that I've seen, and so it constructs this map. So we're using this technology now along with uh, sensor data, and so we call that sensor fusion. And so the two hard problems that we're working on in our robot are localization and sensor fusion. And if you sensor fusion means combining this type of data with odometry and with GPS to say, where am I? And where can I go? And so these are very hard problems. I was telling, you know, for those coders in the room who are used to JavaScript that always returns a Boolean value, in the real world, all the data is noisy. We're kind of approximating. We use things called, uh, you know, particle filters to say, ah, close enough. Like, I think I'm here. Like, I'm good enough. I'll just keep going until something happens. Um, but that stuff's really fun. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, I think I only have one more thing. So could you put, like, a 360-degree camera on there and do that? Or does it have to be directional? So uh, some of the algorithms, is, so this one is particular, our tab map will allow for what we call multiple, and if you have multiple cameras, it can work better. Yeah, because then you can fill in the gaps. But the whole point of our tab too is that um, it's somewhat memory efficient, and you have to tune it a little bit. So you'd have to tune it uh, depending on if your computer could support it, because it's kind of doing, it's basically got like a working memory where it's sort of trying to do like points that it thinks are very nearby, and then it's got, it moves stuff into long-term memory and kind of does a look like a... It's got its RAM and then storage. Yeah, and it's it's a neat algorithm that can, can be tuned based on the hertz. So if you've got a bunch of compute uh, of those, it probably, it won't work on a Pi. I, I know yeah. that. Um, it's not powerful enough. No, no. And a lot of the RTAB stuff, some of this new stuff is kind of requiring some pretty beefier stuff. Like NVIDIA's been building a lot of neat, you know, graphics stuff to help do some of this stuff. But on a, on a, you can do this on like a ThinkPad, like with a decent like i7, I think is what they recommend for some of our tab. But as you add multiple cameras, it more can more get better. There's more data, but there's more also more calculations. Could you it's process it somewhere else, like not in the robot? So the whole point of it would be real time. Yeah. Now there are other SLAM algorithms that can allow for offline. So essentially, you know, your question would be, can you, so you could collect all the data and then you could send it somewhere and then the server could go, oh, got it, like I recalculated it all for you offline. So you can't do that in real time? Can't do it, if, if you wanted to use some of those, you could do it. I mean, it's just, it's a hard problem uh, you know, to do. And especially like if you're trying to do, the reason we call we wouldn't call that SLAM is because it's not simultaneously localizing and mapping, it's, it's localizing and then mapping later. Yeah. Different algorithm. Um, Oh, the last thing I could show you is um, what we're what we're trying to, to get at is um, there we go. Um, <clears throat> what we're trying to do is essentially build this code, and this is part of our thing. But we are building the Molon algorithm, and so what it does is it uses these boundaries. And basically, uh, Ross is, is sort of, to, to mow the lawn, we wanna take our path that we plan for it, we wanna make sure that we follow the right path, and then follow that path, and we win. So this is what we're writing, this is uh, what Ross code looks like. So I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Questions? Yeah, How are you interfacing with the XMR? Like, lever? So um, we, our software people. And so hardware, we're trying to de-risk that side. We're working with uh, an, a firm uh, called Kicker Designs, and they do a lot of prototyping here in town. And what we task them with is trying to uh, hook into those actuators. Now we do have some mechanical engineer who's working on it on our end. And what we're trying to do is there are uh, three places you can hook into it. And we know because we've done a ton of reporting and scientific experiments on this, but um, underneath the mower, there is, um, like I said, there's two actuators that do those controls, and those are connected to rods, uh, and there's sort of a U-shaped thing that will sort of say, like, give more power to this wheel, more power to this wheel. And so what we're trying to do is the current plan is to build, uh, 
precise actuators that can rotate that same knob that I would be doing pushing and pulling. And so there's, um, when we apply more side, we use the actuator to sort of turn it, it'll turn this way and turn that way. And so once we get that hardware control, we'll be able to control that mower. So the reel on that mower, there's only really one thing. You set the throttle to whatever speed, and so we hopefully <coughs> won't do it at the fastest level. Uh, and then when, when it's sort of standard, uh, they're not in motion, when they're both flat, it doesn't go anywhere. And only when you push forward or pull back do the actual things go. So it is a hard part, and we are working on it. But there is a hardware interface that hopefully will convert, you know, when we say, hey, go 80% or 100%, it'll push it all the way forward. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. If you have any ideas, we're open. Yeah, here. Um, typically when you have the mower, it's a rigid frame. Yes. Suspension. So when you get into a depression on the lawn, one side of the wheel lifts up and loses traction. How does that address that part? Spinning. And with that tendency, it also scalps that area that will be remotely higher before it well, think, keep in mind that um, you know our prototype is for flat lawns. Even these machines are not suited for that too, like in hilly areas. Even the manufacturer of this says don't use it on 15 grade. Mm -hmm. um, when you typically see like professionals sort of do it, they have all kinds of tricks that they would do. My gut would be when we're at that stage, uh, we, our machine would be learning those tricks. And so when, it, when there is an area that requires that, the machine could lift the plate and do a lot of the tricks that people do. But for now, you know, we're just trying to get a good cut. And so what I would say to people who have hilly lawns is I would say, like, let's, let us do the hard part, the long flat places, and then let us machine learn from a human and see how they do it and see if we can help them so that they can focus on doing like things, make it more beautiful. So maybe they could even give it, you know, uh, like once it does that they could say hey bad robot you know like machine learn this like don't do it that way like tilt to the right and lift your you know apply more weight here and we could do that hopefully yeah, in the future but you're right when the wheel slips you lose odometry yeah. and that's why you also that's the whole thing about localization is that everything's noisy and nothing's perfect yeah. and so it's basically sort of like at some point somebody says hey you're here and so the odometry says okay I'll just reset and I'll try it again and you know, and so the whole point being like, you know, if odometry says you've only gone a foot and, uh, you know, your GPS says you're way out here, like, which one do you trust, you know? And so hopefully there's a confidence score or, or a particle filter or neither. Uh, and so hopefully you just, and, and what we're going to do, honestly, is if the machine ever gets confused is we're just going to stop because we're supervised. We're, this is a cobot. You know, this autopilot would say, hey, I don't know where I am. And it's very easy, as you saw, to just jump back on it, and we hope that the human operator could correct it and say, oh, hey, you were, you just slipped. You're fine, you're, you're close, or whatever, and then jump back on and fix it. Question over here. Yeah, how unreliable, you mentioned put some of the merchant you in, how unreliable is I'm biased because uh, I want them to, them to say that they're very unreliable. The Husqvarna 450S is very good. Uh, what it is not good at is there are certain lawns where if you have rocks or um, roots, uh, you know, and other things, like it's just, it's very dumb. You know, when you think about it, like it's literally just like a Roomba and so it's got that stupid Roomba algorithm where it just bounces on the walls and just chooses a random algorithm and stops. And so, you know, it's fun to watch, but after a while you just get annoyed because it's just so dumb. Um, and you know, it's, uh, I think it's a unique toy. I think if I were like uh, one of these manufacturers and I didn't have one, like I'd come out with one and I'd put a boundary wire on it and say I have one. Um, but is it the ideal system? Like will we all get them? Uh, I don't think so. And I think that, um, I think that us Americans, like we like this type of lawn. I know I do, like I like this one a lot better than like some rando, you know, half mode and then the outer boundary looks kind of messed up because it doesn't get to the all the way to the edge and I still need to mow the edge. Um, and, and, and frankly, I would love to see like design in the lawn one day, like right, the GT logo or the Kennesaw KSU Owl logo in the lawn. Like how cool would that be? And robots could do that. That's why basically a straight trimmer though. It's basically a what? A straight trimmer would do that. Yeah, and it, it is. Um, <coughs> You know, and, and they do have some neat technology there, like uh, they, they, the recent one has these uh, blades that only come out with centrifugal force, 
which is kind of nice. And so, like, like, if you do run over, like, a toy, like a rubber toy, it kind of only cuts it up a little bit as opposed to the older model that had spinning blades that would just, like, destroy it, you know? Um, now, the ones we are operating with, like, those are not toys. Like, these are serious machines and not to be uh, played with. But I have to think that, like, just like I think that I know that cars will ultimately drive better than us, like, I think our our lawnmowers will ultimately drive better, especially if we give them the technology and train them to do so. It'd be hard for them to drive worse than me. There you go. <laughs> Someone admitting that they're a worse driver than me. So are all, all of your sensors connected to the main CPU, or are they different modules? Yeah, so the way ROS works is it's, uh, ROS is this, uh, is a, each module is like a node in ROS, and so um, depending on sort of like a sensor, like I'll give you an example, like the Intel RealSense 435D, which is the camera we're using, um, happens to have a ROS sort of driver. It's, a, it's written in C, and so it can very quickly sort of, and you can tell it like, I want you to publish, say, camera data and stereo data and anything else you got on all these different things, and so you boot that up. And in fact, in ROS, you can basically have what we call a ROS launch. So you can launch the entire robot and it could pull up all the nodes that it requires and they all register. But yeah, it is all running on the same CPU, right? So it's basically, if you think about the robot operating system, like I care less about the underlying architecture, be it x86 or ARM or whatever, because I'm operating at that operating system level. Right, but I'm just thinking, software guy too. Yeah. <laughs> just thinking, uh, each node was a separate, could be a separate little node, and they would network together, then you wouldn't care. That's right. And you saw that in there, you right? You have a lot more flexibility as to the placement and... Yeah. And if you remember, like, I think there is a, in, in the ROS version, like, you can do that, right? So, uh, right. you could have a separate computer, and now it's using, I believe it's, I think it's UDP, like, or some kind of transport protocol that you can say like, hey, just connect to this ROS master. Right, right, but just taking the camera node out, taking the, the laser node right. out, and all the, <coughs> any of the sensor nodes and just making, saying, hey, I just want it physically separated from the main CPU so that you know, if we had a true network protocol going through the device, then you have a lot more flexibility in how we construct it. Yeah, and I wish, um, uh, did you hear, were you here for software automation last month? Uh, I, was, uh, I was here for the sewing machine. Yeah, the sewing machine. So yeah. I don't know if you caught, but like they use, all of theirs are on the network. So right. like they use that, you know, ethernet, you know, and they push out a ton over that bus. And so every sing single thing is network. Like you're right, each one is separate. Right. Yeah. And that's one way to do it for sure. Um, yeah, totally. Any question? When did you guys start? Uh, we started on this in earnest in October. Oh, wow. What, what month is it? Uh, is it November? November. Okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's not long. That's yeah. a lot of progress. We, I, we started in September, end of September? End of September. End of September. Wow. How many employees? We have three, but we are also part of the Atlanta Venture Studio, which means that we have fractional support. We have marketing, we have finance, we have sales. Our co-founder is David Cummings, who loves starting companies. He kind of like accidentally starts companies, even though he doesn't want to, and even those work he out. Accidentally starts companies. He's just very good at it. I think it's it's non-intentional and think intentional. It's good to have. Yeah, and um, so he uh, he is created in the Atlanta Tech Village, which is a great place to be if you're an entrepreneur or startup. He's created the studio, which is a special place where they're trying to systematically create startups, and this is one that he and I want to start and will into the world. We've both done startups before, and so we're moving a little fast, which is cool. Um, we're not messing around. Yes. So we've got, uh, we took on some venture money, uh, and we've got a seed round, and we're going after it. Question here, and then I'll go here. Once you solve the lawn mowing robot problem, what's the next outdoor activity? Um, I, you know, my, in my grand scheme, you, I, I can, I, I, yeah, I it may change. But in my vision, I think that once we hit lawn maintenance, which is the different from lawn care, lawn maintenance refers to the cutting of lawns, so uh, edging, weeding, blowing, make sure the lawn looks good. I think a very natural 
uh, progression would be to take what we were doing for commercial and try and apply it to a better version of the consumer model, an auto mower that operates on software. And I think that would be pretty natural. Um, it is interesting though, I don't want to create the hardware, so I'd love to partner with a smart company, you know, Husqvarna, if you're listening, I will do it for you. Um, uh, I think that would be natural. Where I would also see us going, sort of bifurcating, would be lawn care, which would be uh, fertilizer, uh, pesticide, aeration. Uh, I think snow blowing, if you're in the north, is very popular and it is something that we could totally do. There's a company called North Star Robotics that's doing that in the north, uh, and they seem to be doing pretty well. Wait, they have grass? I know they do both. I think when you when you sign up, at least in Boston, I think you need somebody to do snow and blow or snow and mow or blow and mow. I don't know what it is. What do they call it? But um, and then I think uh, all kinds of other outdoor activities. I think um, I think pesticide application. I mean, I don't. I think it's. I think it's. We're gonna look back and be like, why did we make humans like go and like do this? You know, and then walk and then do this and then walk and do this when we could have robots that we design do it. I think outdoor activities are especially suited because I think it's just being out in the sun is, I'd rather go play while the robot's doing this and be with my family and music and all these other fun things that humans do as opposed to doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, I think also, um, you know, there's like, you have to, we have to clean 18 wheelers. There's like training to do it, like cleaning like outdoor stuff, uh, all kinds of fun outdoor stuff that we I could be supervising. Cut down trees and split the wood for you. Yeah, pruning, so, yeah, pruning. tree pruning. Yeah. Tree pruning is actually, you know, and we did a lot of um, ride-alongs with, like, some crews at Lawn.com and other landscapers, and the tree thing is really hard and really tough. Like, the lawn guys tell me, they're like, oh, they're like, you know, mowing is boring, and but it's kind of like a mental jive because I'm having to do all this other hard work. And so they, but this is really hard when they have to hold it up and cut, and they're like, so I think a robot could really shape those kind of nice, too, as well. We've got a lot of trees here in Atlanta. Yeah. yeah. Tree care. If you know of others, let us know. We'll go that after. One that can climb the tree instead of sending the people up there. Cut you know, the dead limb. Well, see, and that's interesting too, right? Because if you think about a robot, like a lot of us like like designing bipedal robots just because they can navigate in the human space. But if you had the chance to design a tree climbing robot, like maybe it would look more like like a monkey, or maybe it would look more like a sloth, or it's like some spiked wheels. Yeah, or maybe, maybe you know, it could spikes. look totally different. You know, maybe it's circular. You know, just like. I don't know. Biomimicry, right? Fly up there. Yeah, a drone. Uh, sorry, I, I came really late. That's okay. But what I could deduce from your images and these discussions is that it's a fairly large machine. I guess you guys are doing. But you mentioned Roomba, I have, and you, I have and a you video mentioned of me on it. Oh, but yeah, I, did you see it? Yeah, these okay. are fairly large machines. All right, all right. You guys show them the video. Cool beans. Good video. Yeah, what, what was your question? I'm sorry. You mentioned uh, Roomba, and you mentioned uh, immediately when I thought about Roomba, I thought about Boston Dynamics and their first, uh, some of their first applications, which was somewhat smaller. But by putting something like this, you have a whole list of other issues that you're going to deal with, like subsoil compaction as a result of the heavy weight of the hardware. You're choosing real sense. And I was curious, like, why in real sense? Why not Qualcomm's event-driven cameras or? Yeah, why not? I mean, we're at the stage we're at, we're open. I mean, like, to me, I care less about the actual hardware implementation. I'm the software guy. To me, it's a job to be done, and we'll build the tool to do it. This is the difference, I think, between me and, say, Rethink Robotics, is that I'm not trying to build the ultimate robot. I'm trying to solve with robotics and build software that gets the job done. So if there's a better tool and we find it tomorrow, like we'll use it. But just like, uh, just as a sort of curiosity, why outdoor events as opposed to, they started with indoor, like with vacuuming or whatever. I think indoor is easier. <coughs> yeah. And, and so I was just why. curious, like, why there's why no started. wrong answer. I was just curious, like what was the opportunity that you guys were like, you know what? Honestly, I think that here in the Southeast in Atlanta, Honestly, I think in Atlanta, I think in New York and San Francisco, they don't give a shit about lawns. I think here in the them. South, we do, and we love them. And, uh, and I think that it's a uniquely, uh, it's a startup that's uniquely suited to us and the challenge that we have in Southeast. Um, and I think it's a cool company to build. And I just think it's a, a, 
also, it's a great company to build because the grass just keeps growing. Like, my co-founder loves recurring revenue, and there's a recurring revenue model for it for monthly subscriptions. Yeah. And you think about the labor that you're using, I think it just matches up to something that makes a big company. But you said your plan was to go from, like, if you get this one to work and win, then you go When to, we get to work yeah, not it. I mean. Thank you. Then you go to a commercial one, so you... So you basically put the grass care companies out of business with your next version. Well, it's really important that we don't put anybody out of business because if you listen, and we listened hard to our customers, they said things like this. And I know as an investor in loan.com, we had this problem too. They said, uh, we can't find any, we can't find enough people to do the work we have. So they're already going out of business and they need help. Yes. Well, not only that, yeah, customers are upset. So, so if okay. you are a, if you run a lawn company, you're an ops manager, and I've spoken to you on the phone, and I spoke to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. They would say things like, "I've got, I've got, ten, three man crews, three person crews. Excuse me, I've got ten three person crews, and on Tuesday, a few of them don't show up. Like they literally just don't show up. They've got construction jobs or whatever it is that they're doing, and they just don't show up. Like and then one day, like, they'll half show up or whatever. And so he's like, I have all these job sites that are literally customers are angry. They're not, they're just, it's not, the lawns are not getting mowed. And so I tell him, I say, hey, take those 10 three-person crews you have, add our robotics, and now you can have 15 two-person crews. Same amount of people. Yeah. Now with our robotic workers, you can double it and you can have half your customers and we can get the job done. Yeah, see I thought you said with like the next version after you made that one would just be like one that normal people could buy and it would cut their lawns. Well, think, think about it this way, you're right. I think there will be some people that might take another solution that would say, uh, you know, you could, you could actually do it even crazier. You could completely cut out sort of the lawn maintenance side of it and you could throw these robots down and sort of mow a lawn. Uh, I do think there is time for, for that to happen. But yeah, you're right. There is, there's other models where you could even completely reduce the human element of it and they could now focus on saying like, hey, I come out and make your lawn more beautiful and trim these things so and do this other stuff just besides just sitting on the robot. mower. What's that? Human comes and just drops off the robot and then trims your trees. Yeah, I think we're a little far from that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do think that there are parts of the labor that we could totally help move up the chain. The economic term for that is freeing up labor to do, you know, higher end stuff. Like they could come out and say, hey, like, what if we did it differently here? Or maybe we could do different hardscaping or something else. So could you speak a little bit more to your, the customers you were referencing? Are they like golf courses? Or so our ideal customer profile is the ops manager uh, right now of commercial lawn care companies that do larger turf areas. So that might be, there are, they do do residential. Um, usually they would do like, a, we call it a REIT, or R-E-I-T, Real Estate and Trust, or like a neighborhood association where they're sort of locked in and say they do the whole neighborhood. So they show up in these box trucks uh, and they have all this equipment. And so they'll either do, so REITs are good, uh, office parks are good, areas that have larger turf areas. So areas like this building out here that has accent lawns, we call these accent pieces, are probably not a good fit for us now. Uh, they could be for a robo mower where there's, it's more supervised and there's somebody coming out and plopping it down and sort of doing it. But for now, it's larger turf areas. Um, golf courses are somewhat automated in Europe. Uh, they've got these big tractors that do it because they can do larger areas and they can be off. Um, Wait, the tractors bit. are automated? They have, oh yeah, tractors are definitely a, a yeah, lot I more tractors. They were, I've seen videos of them, but I thought there was somebody driving them. Some of them are, um, and, and again, like they can be off a meter because the mowing platform is so big, they do like the fairway. And so they'll, and, and it's very inefficient because if they're off a meter or three meters with GBS, like, but it doesn't matter because the, the plate is so big. Um, and so those have been some time saving for sure. Um, but you have to be careful with those too. How do they do the, their perimeter weeding, perimeter setting? Uh, I'm not sure. I think they're using like GPS and I think they also are using some of the real-time kinematics uh, because that, that, the way that works with a base station is that you apply the base station and then it sends correctional data, kind of like a fourth point. You know, GPS operates off three points, you know, 120,000 miles away and says, here you go, here's triangulate. And then when you add that fourth point, I think the, the base stations send out radio correction within 10 kilometers. So you can install that like at the golf pro house 
can be like on the truck. Right, or on the truck, which is what we're doing. I'm actually more excited about the visual slam, yeah. uh, you know, than I am with the, the GPS stuff. Like that, that um, the accuracy on this, like, I mean, it, it doesn't really work with a lot of occlusion. When you get really under a lot of tree cover, like we did a ton of tests down at Georgia Tech, and when there's a ton of tree cover, like it starts going way off, like, you know, and you're starting to get like, it's like, boom, jumps over here, and you're like, ah, shit, I'm not right there, I'm right here. Um, so I'm more excited about this V-SLAM, like the, the stuff that uh, we're doing with camera and depth, where it's doing these point clouds, and these are like, you know, very good 3D like models of where you are, both height and, and I think this is going to be the future. I think if I were doing software, this is where I would do it. I, it's, to me, it feels like cheating when we're using, just swapping out a boundary for a GPS boundary, and this is more like the actual thing we're mowing. I mean, would you so, still have to do a boundary with that? Well, think about it. Like, the way that we're modeling it is that the human operator still does the boundary anyway. But what's neat is once you save this, if you think about the way it works, like, we, we can save it, and then once you get here, like, on property, like, we can load up the same point cloud and be like, and I know where I am, it. and just check it. And then, you know, when you're doing the inside, like, it would record everything in there, too, and, like, re it gets it better and better. The test that we've done with this algorithm, like, we go out and you go around, it gets better and better and better and better. That's cool. And their question over here, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you, you just answered that. I, I, I was just wondering if you would do that each and every time, or if you're working on a big business, you just map it once and then find a different algorithm to actually log it on. Uh, we're definitely going to be keeping the data, um, which I think is crucial, right, to get better and better. So, you know, you can load up the job or the site that we're at um, and say, let me load up the point cloud. Right. The, the problem with the point cloud in Visual Slam, though, is, and you'll notice it in this video, is different lighting. Right. So it is using some of the RGB data. Now, if it's just depth, like, you know, it gets a little better, but it's using all of them. It's sensor fusion, right? Did you RGB plus de depth. Yeah. Did you put a spotlight on there so it's consistent? But we got to go. We're getting kicked out of the room. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, so thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Hey, question. Do we have the next meetup scheduled? The next meetup is in January.